I'm in Hebrews chapter 9 this morning. As you're turning there, I have a, uh, we've got a few special guests, but there's not more special than my mother, Miss Susan. Y'all give her a round of applause for being here this morning. Appreciate her, all she has to deal with. Her husband's here. My stepfather, Greg, he's here. <laughs> Proud of him and what the Lord's done in his life as well. Hebrews chapter 9, going to be talking to you about the appointed time. Church, all of us have a lot of appointments that we don't have to go to. Aren't you glad that there are some appointments that you set and you can wiggle your way out of them? Or if you just don't want to show up, there's a lot of appointments that you don't have to go to. Every once in a while you can call and make up some excuse. Uh, you, you, you don't want to go to that particular meeting or fulfill that reservation. But there's one appointed time for every one of us in this room that we cannot wiggle ourselves out of. And it's called the appointment of death. Hebrews chapter 9, if you'll look with me at verse 27, this is what God's Word says. It says, Just as a man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Lord, I praise you that you've sent your word to us to change our lives, to speak to us, to transform us. Lord, we know that the way that we're born, the state that we're born, that's not the state that you want us to remain in. And I'm grateful that you've sent us a word to guide us and lead us into a way that is transformational. Lord, I ask that you speak to us this morning. I know without a shadow of a doubt, every single person that's sitting here is the ones that you wanted to be here this morning. Because we've prayed about it and we've sought after your presence and your guidance. Lord, perhaps there are some that are sitting here that don't really want to be here. Maybe they're a family member or drug them in, maybe some a friend has begged them over and over to come and so they've just showed up really not expecting anything. But Lord, I pray that you give them the ability to remove any distractions that may be present within their mind. I pray that you give them the ability to focus upon you. Open our ears, help us to be attentive and receptive to what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heard about a couple who lived in Chicago and they got tired of the cold weather and so they were ready for some warmer weather. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that many people retire in the north and they move to the south. You don't ever hear of people retiring from the south and moving to the north, do you? I think if you're southern, if you're born a southern person and you're saved, that's, that has to be like a triple blessing, amen? I, I'm southern born, southern bred, and when I die, I'll be Dixie dead, amen? <laughs> it's a blessing to, to be from the south and saved. Anyway, the wife of this couple said, honey, I have to go to work, I, I have to go do some things, so why don't you fly down to Florida, and I'll work a day, and then I'll fly down to meet you. So the husband did just that. But he got to missing his wife, as some of us do. And so he decided to write her an email. And he got to trying to remember the email, and he almost remembered it, leaving out one letter. As a result of that, the email ended up going to a lady that had just lost her husband the day before. When the lady read, read the email, she screamed and she fainted, and here's what the email said. Dearest wife, I just got checked in. Everything's already prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Your loving husband, P.S., 
It sure is hot down here. I think it's important, church, to think about the afterlife. Many times that's a, that's a y'all dial back in. Many times we, we, we think negatively about that and we, we don't really want to think much about death. But church, it's, it's a part of life. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. And I think it's important for us to, to talk about it. I want to share with you two dates that are extremely important to me. The first one is July the 31st, 1978. That's the date of my birth. I know I look a lot younger, but I'm not. That's the date of my birth. And, and a lot of people, some people aren't too big on birthdays, but most of us are. And, and no matter who you are, especially in America, we celebrate the day of our birth. I want to give you another date that's kind of interesting to me, and that's the year 2059. That's interesting to me because I got to messing around on the Internet. I don't encourage that. But I, I, I found a life expectancy calendar, or calculator, rather. And you type in your date of birth, you type in, uh, you answer some questions, and it gives you an expected date that you're going to die. I checked out two of these things, and both of them gave me the date of 2059. Now, as a pastor, I've seen more than I want to of sudden deaths. And it's a continual reminder to me that you cannot trust a life expectancy calendar. You cannot trust the fact that we could have a long life here on this earth. But what I do know is that God has an appointed time of death for you. He has an appointed time of death for me. And that clock is ticking for each and every one of us. I want to tell you something that each of us must learn when we go through a tragic death or even an unexpected death. Though they're extremely painful lessons, there's two things that you need to remember. We have to face death. That's a part of life. But we do not have to fear death. We have to face it, church, no matter what. But you do not have to fear it. Hebrews 2, 14, 15, it says, Since the children have flesh, blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I want to talk to you, share some few th a few things with you about this topic of death. Right from our passage that we've read, number one is this. We all have a destiny with death. We all have a destiny with death. Verse 27, it simply says, Just as a man is destined to die once. The word destined literally means to be laid up, to lay aside, or in other words, to make a reservation. You, you know when, when, when you make a reservation to a hotel or to a motel or, or a, a party, you're, you're telling them that you're going to be there. It's pretty much set in stone. And that's, that, that's what this word is, is trying to tell us. You have an appointed time, appointed day, a minute, a second, a moment. That's been a lay aside for you to die here on this earth and to go from this life to the next. You ever had an appointment that you just didn't want to fulfill? Yeah, you ever set up a scheduled appointment or a reservation and then some things happen and, and you or you you realize what's going to happen and you say, Man, I gotta get out of this one. Uh, and so you start coming up with all kinds of excuses to wiggle yourself out of it. Church, that can't happen to this appointment. It's an appointment that every single one of us in this room has to fulfill. Our meeting with death cannot be avoided. This reservation with death, we cannot cancel. 
It's one that we must keep. Three people every second keep this appointment. 180 people every minute keep this appointment. 11,000 people every hour keep this appointment. 260,000 people every day keep this appointment. That's about 95 million people a year who keep this appointment that we call death. The world would call some deaths an accident. The unexpected impact of one car with another. The gun that was left in the top drawer with the safety off and a child found it. Tragic but accidental. Really, church, all these are appointments. We serve a sovereign God who is in complete control of what goes on on this planet. You have to believe that. We don't serve a God who has his hands up, who, who just decides to step in every once in a while, decides to change this and decide. We serve a complete, 100% sovereign God. And he's in complete control of this world. Heard about two teenagers who were talking one day at school and one said, wouldn't it be neat? It'd be pretty awesome if, if we could, could know when and where we were going to die. And the friend said, man, what good would that do you? And his friend said, I just wouldn't show up. <laughs> Church, there's no choice. Whenever that time comes... There's two things about death that really bother us. There's the certainty of death. You know, we know that we're going to die. Without a shadow of a doubt, we know it's going to happen sometime. Have you ever thought about we're the only, we're the only created beings that know we're going to die? A plant doesn't know when they're going to die. Dogs and cats and other animals, they, 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 don't, uh, uh, con they don't have a concept that they're going to die one day. But we as human beings, we know, and many times that scares us because we know that we can't live forever on this earth. But not only does it bother us that we know that, there's the certainty of death, but it, it bothers us about the uncertainty of death. You see, even though that we know that we're going to die, we don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know where. We don't know what the circumstances are going to be when that time comes for us. You have an appointment with death just like I do. You have a destiny with death that has to be fulfilled. Every single one of us. But not only that, number two is this. We all have a date after death. You see, we have a destiny with death, but we all have a date after death. I cannot tell you the number of times I've had people ask me, particularly after a funeral or, or something tragic that, that, that had happened, and, and they'll say, what in the world happens after we die? Well, that's a deep question, and it calls for a very, very long answer. But I can tell you this. According to verse 27, it says, Just as man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. After that, to face judgment. We all have a date with judgment when this life is over. First there's death, and then there's judgment. Do you know why one follows the other? There's, there's three words that's always connected throughout Scripture. Remember these. You've got sin, death, judgment. Sin, death, judgment. They're always connected in Scripture. The reason for death is sin. Romans 5.12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. I read the other day the number one cause of death in America at this moment. It, it changes from time to time. But at this moment is heart disease. And church, that's really not true. The number one reason for death is sin. 
So and so's been raped. A child has been molested. Bad things happen. It doesn't happen because God causes it. It happens because the sin that infiltrates this world that we know as earth. It's sin. It's the number one problem. It's the number one reason that people die. It wasn't in, it wasn't in God's original plan for us to die. It wasn't originally in His plan for us to experience death. But because of sin, death is now a part of this life. I know sometimes we think that people really get away with certain things. I come across this here in the United States. If you burglarize someone, your chances of being arrested is only 7%. If you're, the, uh, if you're unlucky enough to be one of those 77%, only 87% of you will be prosecuted. If you're one of those 87% that are prosecuted, only 79% will be convicted. If you are one of those 79% that are convicted, only 25% will actually go to prison. When you multiply all those probabilities, it means if you decide to become a burglar, you'll only have a 1.2 chance of going to jail. I've got good news for you. You, you. you can call it good or call it bad. It d- depends on where you are with your relationship with God. But all of us are going to face judgment. Every single one of us. There's no way to wiggle yourself out of that. When death happens, all of us will face judgment. Nobody escapes it. If you refuse to accept Jesus Christ into your life, you'll stand before God as your judge and give an account for your refusal. If you receive Jesus Christ into your life, you don't have to face that kind of judgment, but you will be judged for what you did for Christ on this earth. The difference between the two is one determines punishment and the other determines rewards. But we'll all be judged for what we do here in this life. The point is that not only do we have an appointment with death that we have to keep, but we have an appearance before God that we have to make. Message on death wouldn't be complete without this last point, and it's this. You see, we all have a destiny with death. We have a date after death. But number three is this. We all have a decision before death. We all have a decision to make. Before death happens, you're appointed to die and you'll keep that appointment. You've been subpoenaed to make an appearance in God's courtroom and you'll have to make that appearance. Verse 28 tells us, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And He'll appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. The little word so connects verses 28 with 27. And there's a reason for that. In verse 27, we see that we have three problems. Remember, it's sin, it's death, and judgment. And in 28, we see the solution to all of those problems. He died to save us from our sins. He was raised to deliver us from death. And He's coming again to spare us from the wrathful judgment of God. Remember I told you that there are two types of judgment. One to give punishment and the other to give rewards. Every one of us is going to have to face Jesus. But not every one of us is going to face the first judgment. You see the first judgment has to do with with whether we've received Jesus or not. And it's at that moment that we'll be declared that we're not a child of God. Those that, that don't know Him. But if you know Him... You don't have to fear that kind of judgment. Hebrews 10, 26 through 27, it says, No sacrifices can be made for people who decide to sin after they find out about the truth of Jesus Christ and His salvation. They are God's enemies, and all they can look forward to is a terrible judgment and a furious fire. If you reject Jesus, you accept judgment. If you accept Jesus, you escape. Judgment. 
You see, one of these days, you're going to breathe your last. One of these days, this life will be over for you. And when you breathe your last breath on this life, you'll breathe your first breath in eternity. That place will either be heaven or it will be hell. And church, I I really think that if we could ever grasp one thing about this life, about this thing we call death, of of what happens uh, before it happens, if we could ever grasp this one thing, Once death happens, once you close your eyes, whether you get in a car wreck, leaving from here, whether it happens tomorrow, whether it happens a year from now, whenever it happens, there are no do-overs. There are no second chances. There are no mulligans. There there, there is no time to say, well, I'm going to get right this time. When this life is over, it's over. You ever really thought much about your entire existence? I I really, really think about. You talk about your life here on earth and what happens afterwards. This rope represents our our entire existence. But see, this right here, it, it just represents our time on earth. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing to me that we live our entire life thinking about this. In fact, it's most, most of us, it's not even this. Well, I'm, I, I just can't wait until I get retired and the kids are out of the house and, and I don't have to work anymore. I'm going to go on vacation and do this or that. So, so we really got about this much time that we're living for. Oh, I I just can't wait till I get to this little part right here. What about all this? What about all this? It's amazing to me that we get our entire thought process wrapped up in this. Church, this is nothing. You've got millions and millions and millions and millions, endless years after this time is over. Have you thought about all of this? If if you were to have to suffer, if you were to have to go through some trials, if you were to have to go through some bad times, wouldn't it make sense to do it here instead of here? If you were to have to do without some things, if you were to have to sacrifice some things in life, if you were to have to say, no, I I would like to do that, but I can't do it. If you were to have to make those tough decisions, wouldn't it make sense to make them here instead of for all eternity? Church, I, I want you to think about this. This is what's most important. It doesn't mean a hill of beans what happens here except that you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's what makes all the difference. That's what makes all the difference. I don't know where you are right now. But I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? That's a clock ticking in your life. That's a clock ticking in my life. At some point, only on God's choosing, not your own, that clock will stop. And when it stops... You'll go be with Jesus if you know Him. But if you don't, you'll spend the rest of eternity in a place that we call hell. 